All right, we do have a speaker on the uh, on the phone. So this is Christophe Michel, who's um, one of the top. Uh, um, uh, what do they call them on um, on Code Arena? Um, what's that? Wardens. Wardens on Code. That's right. So, um, uh, Christophe will be will be giving the talk um, uh, on price manipulation exploits. All right. Yeah. Hey, I'm Christophe Michel. I'm an independent security auditor. And today's talk is about price manipulation exploits, or a different title would be a brief history of landing protocol exploits, because what we'll be doing today is we will build a landing protocol, and then exploit it, and iterate on it, and then get hacked again, and then the cycle continues. But first of all, uh, what is this about? Well, protocols need some way to get prices of an asset, and they can do it on chain for. Uh, long tail assets, especially because usually long tail assets are not traded on a centralized exchange. And the question becomes, how do you get any price from a decentralized exchange like an AMM and in a tamper-proof way so you can't really manipulate it? And we'll be building these landing protocols on Uniswap V2 for now. And just a quick recap how this works. So Uniswap V2 has pools. A pool consists of two pairs of tokens, X and Y. And someone provides some initial liquidity of X, X tokens and Y, Y tokens. And the ratio defines the relative price, the spot price, X per uh, Y per X tokens. And then you compute some initial value K and it's set to a square root of X times Y. And then these pool balances X, Y, and this derived value K define this Uniswap with two invariant x times y equals k, which you've probably heard of before. And then you can also uh, derive it some swap out amount y out that's depending on some x amount for swapping it in. I think the best way to visualize this is by looking at uh, it geometrically. And the way it works here is, for example, so what on the x-axis, there's the x reserves. And on the y-axis, you see the y reserves. And here, if you look at this point at the top, p start, uh, it's at x equals 1 and y equals 4. So someone provided initial uh, liquidity of x equals 1 and y equals 4. And then you get this k value of 4. And this x times y equals 4 defines this green curve that you see here. And then a state of the MM, always the current state is a point on this curve. And what happens is that if you trade, then you move along this curve. So if you trade some X in amount of three, then the, what you get out, this Y out is just here, this difference on the Y axis, and you end up at this new point PN here below. So, Using Uniswap V2, we can build a landing protocol. And the way we do that is, and how most of pretty much all DeFi landing protocols work nowadays, is by users who can deposit and borrow tokens. And they need to satisfy this inequality, which basically just says that the sum of the collateral value needs to be greater than the sum of the borrows and which is the sum of the deposits. So the price of the X token times the number of tokens deposited times some collateral factor X and similar for the borrows. And what is this collateral factor? Well, we choose it to be less than 100 because we are a over collateralized lending protocol. And why do we need to do that? Because it's a peer to peer lending protocol, which means all tokens that you want to borrow, someone else must have put in. And because you don't know who you're actually lending to, there's no risk framework or anything, and you don't trust anyone. So they need to over collateralize their loan. So in case they just run away and never pay back your borrow, then you can liquidate their collateral and you don't end up with a loss. So the big question now becomes is how do you choose this price function of token X? And the first lending protocol set out to just implement the price function as the spot price of X in the X and USD Uniswap pool. 
but it's pretty easy to exploit this because at some point in 2020, someone invented flash loans. And then what happened here is the attack gets pretty obvious. Like it's, let's start out here at uh, the beginning at the Ethereum price of four here in this case. And what the attacker does, they deposit some US dollar value as collateral to the lending pool. And then they trade on this AMM. And as you can see here, where it says PN and then some number, it's the new price. So initially it was four, but as you trade more and more amounts into it, the new marginal price gets lower and lower. Let's say they trade in 5X. And then you end up at this new point here at the bottom. And you can actually borrow these X tokens at a price of 0 0.11 instead of four. And then they borrow it at this great price. And what the attacker then does, well, they just do the reverse trade. They trade it back up until the real price. And this manipulation cost them only the fees here. And they ended up getting a huge borrow. So, and this was, as coined as this here, the DeFi flash loan tech changed everything. It was in the beginning of 2020 sometime. And since then, uh, well, let's see how to fix this. So what we're doing now is in our V2 of the learning protocol, so we choose the price of X to be the time-weighted average price of X in the pool. And for a while, everything works out well. And then it's... 2020 and your project manager tells you to also support LP tokens because there's this new hot thing of LP tokens and users want to use them in the lending protocol as collateral. So your task is to find out how do you actually price these LP tokens for the lending protocol. And as LP tokens are just a claim on the underlying pool balances X and Y, you can define the price of an LP token just by the pool value divided by how many LP tokens exist, right? And the way you do this mathematically is so the price of an LP token with the underlying X and Y would be the price of X times the reserve of X plus the price of Y times the reserve of Y divided by the LP total supply. And because you learned from your mistakes, this price of Y, you're not using the spot price anymore but you're now using a time-weighted average price to not get hacked by flash loans or any other trades. But then what happens is you still get exploited. And the reason why is because you still didn't really understand how Uniswap V2 works. So, and the read course is what you can see here in this graphic. And, and what you see is here, this yellow line is again, the Uniswap curve. And doing trades, we move along this curve again. And this blue bar chart here, it tells you the X pool balance at the current point, and the red chart tells you the Y balance at the point. And below the blue and red bar charts here, it's just the sum of the individual blue and, and red charts. So, and what you can see here, as we move along the curve, which means as you do trades, the sum here is not constant, it really moves. And what this means in turn is this thing here, like it also moves with trades again. And an attacker can use this to still manipulate the price of an LP token and then profit from it and exploit your contract. And Warp Finance was one of these protocols that were exploited this way, but many of them followed. And then some people thought about, well, why doesn't it fix this when, when we trade? It should be a fixed price, right? And then you can come up with some math and I'll not tell you about the derivation here, just the end result. At some point, people figured out you can come up with a formula here of the LP price, which is two times the square root of price of token zero times price of token one times K divided by the total supply. And as it says here, notice how the price is now only a function of the TWAPs P0, P1, and K. 
And we know from the Uniswap invariant that trades don't move K and P0 and P1 are TWAPs, so they are not moved by trades as well. Thus, this price doesn't move when we do any swaps. So that's great. Now we really understood how Uniswap V2 works, and then we build our new protocol for prices of normal tokens. It's just a TWAP. For prices of new tokens, it's just uh, what we just saw, this new formula of 2 times square root of price x times price y times k divided by the total supply. And then you deploy it, and uh, guess what happens next? You get exploited again, yeah. And if you enjoyed last week's Paradigm CTF and you want to do a CTF challenge, uh, I created one here for this exact uh, problem. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, it's even to today's standard, it's not that obvious, I think, how to exploit it. So if you want to try it, I guess, uh, or if you're watching it on demand, just stop the video and try it yourself because I'll tell you how to exploit this one here. So how do we exploit it? Let's, let's think about what would happen if we double the price, right? So let's say we want to double the LP price. And the LP price, as we said, is just the pool value divided by the total supply. So we would double the pool value, and doubling the pool value just means we would double the reserves. And by doubling the reserves, I, mean, I really mean we just dump tokens into the pool without minting any new LP tokens. We just dump tokens into the pool, and that's the cost we just have to bear with. That's our manipulation pause. It's the pool balance X plus the pool balance Y. Then let's say we also want to buy some LP tokens, uh, some LP amount of LP tokens. So we have some initial cost to acquire these, which is, well, the price of this LP token times LP. And then what we can think about is the what I call the borrowable value, which is um, how much does your collateral change or your borrowable value change? How much can you borrow? And that's just the new LP price times the LP times the collateral factor. And we said that the new LP price, well, it's just double the old ones. It's two times price LP times LP times the collateral factor. And then you can come up with some equations. You do the borrowable amount minus the cost, and then you see that it becomes profitable if the deposited LP tokens are greater than total supply divided by two times collateral factor minus one. And because collateral factor is less than 100%, because we're an over-collateralized lending protocol, what this essentially means is that you need to deposit more LP tokens than the total supply, which seems kind of weird at first sight, because, well, we only have at most total supply LP tokens, how should we deposit more than that? But it turns out it's actually possible to do that. And it's possible if the LP token is both the collateral token and the borrow token. And what you can then do is the following attack. So you're using two accounts here under your control, account A and account B. And account A will have some ETH collateral, and B will build up some LP collateral. So what account A does is you take a huge ETH flash loan, and you deposit this flash loan as collateral, so you can borrow LP tokens against it. And you borrow all the LP tokens in the landing pool. And then you send these LP tokens to your accomplice account B, and from B, you deposit these tokens again into the landing pool as collateral. And because they're now in the landing pool again, what happens is that account A can again borrow the same LP tokens that they already borrowed. And you can kind of end up in the loop doing this over and over and over again. And every time um, account B gets more and more, uh, a bigger and bigger LP position as collateral. And you do this as long or such that at some point the deposited LPs are more than the total supply. 
And at this point, you manipulate the pool price again by dumping tokens into the Uniswap pool. And then the price doubles and it becomes actually profitable to borrow Ethereum against this inflated LP collateral value now. And because account A here, notice how they always borrowed LP tokens, so they have LP debt and the price increased, the price doubled of this LP token. It could be that they're now underwater. And if you want to like min-max this attack, you can actually liquidate your own account A to get some discount again. And in the end, you pay back your ETH flash loan and you get a profit here. So you get hacked again. And here, this is Cream Finance from the timeline is now October 2021, last year. And it's pretty much this attack. It was just uh, not LP tokens, but uh, you earn wall chairs. But otherwise, the attack is exactly the same idea. And now, so you're on your fourth iteration now of building a lending protocol. And I hope you still have users and you can still find someone who yeah, invests in you after getting hacked three times. But let's see. And maybe you should take a step back and really think about what's, what's going on here and what's, what you learn from all of these attacks. So the first thing is, if you think about how the previous attacks happened, you could always manipulate the price in the same transaction, right? And that's kind of a bad practice, I would say, for, for a price oracle. So you should only come up with price oracles that can be manipulated in the same transaction. Because what this leads to is that the exploits at least are not risk-free anymore for the attacker. Because now they can get a flash loan because flash loans need to be paid back in the same block. So they need to put up their own big capital usually. And they also need to keep the price manipulation going on across at least the block, which comes with its own risk of arbitrages. And the second thing we saw that the safety of an oracle depends on the context. So the question is, do all assets really need to be both collateral and borrow tokens? So the, the previous attack was only possible because they were, and there are other lending protocols out there that use the previous um, price oracle, but they are not exploitable because the LP tokens are not collateral. And the modern lending protocols, they kind of do this. Like all the finance, for example, they really think about what asset should be a collateral asset and what should be a borrow asset because in the end your collateral asset should be a highly liquid token and you don't want to have many collateral assets here so these are uh yeah the hardest or the most precious type of assets to get are these collateral assets and also all of these exploits came kind of because there was some missing understanding of the underlying AMM that was used. Also for other modern learning protocols, when Uniswap V3 initially came out, uh, there were many raw refuse protocol hacks because it turns out that Uniswap V3 is easier to manipulate than V2 at some point or in, in some sense because they, it has this concentrated liquidity thing and it concentrates the liquidity around the real price. But what this also means is that an attacker only needs to burn through this uh, really thin price range. And this uh, leads to less slippage when they burn through it. And on other price ranges, there's only very few liquidity. So it also makes it more capital efficient to, uh, to exploit this in some way. Yeah, and that's... The current state of DeFi lending protocols, maybe next year can show you how to also exploit the version four of it. But other than that, if you have any questions for now, uh, reach out to me on Twitter, read my blog, or if you want to try the CTF, then go to my GitHub here and play it. Yeah, and otherwise, thanks a lot. <laughs>